Hello, and welcome to Rock the Cash Bar. I'm Ben Mowbray. And I'm Diane Gallagher. Every week, we pick one song and do a deep dive into the lyrics and explore the different ways they've been interpreted. We will also discuss how the song connected to us on a personal level, focusing on all the embarrassing details. Glad to have you here. Now enjoy the show. Hola, bienvenidos. Esta episode dice seis de la Rock the Cash Bar. Is seis sixteen? I think so. I don't know Spanish at all. Did me either. <laughs> Por favor, permitemi que me presente. Soy un hombre de mucho riqueza, se si en gusto. Did your girlfriend teach you this? No. <laughs> <laughs> Many, many years ago, I, I, I had reason to fall in love with Spanish ladies. Ooh. So I tried to teach myself to speak Spanish by learning classic rock lyrics. Okay. In Espanol. <laughs> it did not take. No? <laughs> no, I, no, I don't speak Spanish at all. Oh, well, you're, you're pulling off the accent really well. I think you could learn it and be authentic sounding. I'm camping up the accent, <laughs> playing it up. You can't see me, but I'm wearing a full Bull Riders costume. <laughs> I like your, Shaking a red cape at I like Diane. your sombrero. <laughs> he's just adding all the things in one. He doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be weird because we're here today to talk about Beelzebub himself. Yes, we are. The Dark Prince. The Devil Incarnate. Oh my god, I'm a little nervous. Me too. I hope nothing like, like pictures are going to fall off the walls or... Things are going to get a little strange. Oh. Do you have a Ouija board in the house? No. No? no I had a Ouija board in... That was all you were alarmed. I won't have them anymore. Really? Yeah, I had one in my house and I've always just felt like um, possibly brought evil into my house and I saw The Exorcist way too young and that's how it started in that movie. Will not have them in the house. I understand. Yeah. A board game mass produced by Parker Brothers. <laughs> Doesn't matter. The devil just needs a vehicle. Then. <laughs> <laughs> I won't even let you draw one on paper. <laughs> the smallest of invites. Mm -hmm. We're doing Sympathy for the Devil. <sighs> By the Glimmer Twins, the Rolling Stones today. And it's weird for me to be so um, weird about the devil when I don't even, I'm not religious. <laughs> I, I, I'm not a Christian. I don't believe it. I don't know if I believe in the whole thing, but I ain't taking no chances mm -hmm. <laughs> at the same time. You don't have to believe in it to be weirded out by it. it. Exactly. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of effort that's been put into making sure that you understand where evil comes from. That there is sin and evil in the world, and we are enjoined by Scripture and the Lord Jesus to oppose it. I I can feel evil more than I can feel God's love sometimes, I think. Like, when you go to New Orleans, I'm like... That was dark. I, <laughs> I feel like when I'm in New Orleans, sometimes I'm like, you can feel the seedy underculture of this place more than anywhere I've ever been Yeah, it makes life. me a little nervous, too. Like, do you guys understand what you're playing with? Mm -hmm. Do you... Mm -hmm. yep. And they do. They understand it a hell of a lot better than I do. Right. But it still doesn't mean that I like them. You know, yeah. I don't. I, I trust that the fire eater is going to be okay too. But I'm not going to stand in front of them. With... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Good point. <laughs> so, how do we approach this song today? I think we just got to dive into it. I mean, this one's been people have been over, through, back, and around this one many, many times. There's a lot to dig into. Uh, let's just get around. To, let's just do it. Let's do it. Let's get in. All right. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. I've been around for a long, long year. Stole many a man's soul and faith. So if you're really listening to it, you don't have to really listen to it closely, but I feel like this song came out in 1969, mm -hmm. at the end of 1969. Yeah. It's song number one on Beggar's Banquet. So the Rolling Stones are already good and evil. Right. I, I mean good and evil. No, okay. I, I don't mean both. I mean they are very evil, I think, in people's minds. They, uh, their previous album was uh, Her Majesty's, or, or Her Satanic Majesty's, what? Am I getting this wrong? 
Don't look at me. Hmm? I don't know my history on the stones as well. At her satanic majesty's request. Okay. That's what it was. So they're already kind of like like on the line. So people already see them as someone who's uh, dabbling in the occult. They're the bad boys. Yeah. And they want you to know that they're the bad boys. Yes. I mean, they're pointedly being the bad boys because they're they're being the, the photo negative of the Beatles, right? Right. And why? Do you know why people pit Stones versus Beatles? Were they just the two biggest bands at that time and it's never stopped? I think so. Okay. But I also think that that part of it, like we weren't there, we weren't there to see it. Like I imagine it's one of those things where you have to make your choice. Mm-hmm. You know, like in our generation, it was just like you kind of had to pick Pearl Jam or Nirvana. <laughs> right. <laughs> Looking back on it now, you never had to. No, of course not. But you sort of did. You okay. know, like I don't think it's as like I don't think it's quite as it's not like rock and hip hop, but I think you definitely had to declare. Like it's fine to be a fan of the Beatles, it's fine to be a fan of the Rolling Stones, but you've got to decide. Are you a Stones guy? You're a Stones girl. I'm a Stones girl. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I would hear this argument and all I knew is I never liked early Beatles. I want to hold your hand stuff, mm-hmm. but I uh, immediately loved Paint It Black and all the dark stone stuff. So I was mm-hmm. like, I think I'm a Stones girl. Yeah. Yeah. I think Mick Jagger was just way more frank. Like they were doing kind of covers of like Muddy Waters and Rhythm and Blues yeah. songs. So like the Beatles are like you say, like, I want to hold your hand. And then Mick Jagger's up there like, all I'm saying is I want to make a love to you. Yeah. That's, but, yeah. I don't, I've just never been... I guess, well, I guess maybe if I had been 10, I would have liked the Beatles. Just like when I was 10, I liked um, New Kids on the Block. But as soon as I become like an adult, like I'm going to go Stones. Mm-hmm. I like this song because this is this is Mick Jagger like declaring, right? Like he's, he's using his private school education. He's using his... Uh, He's using all of his well-earned politess. <laughs> so he is. Let's go right into it. He's like, I was around when Jesus Christ had his moment of doubt and pain. This is 1969. So rock stars are a new thing. Mm-hmm. Rock and roll is still a new thing. And rock and roll stars talking about Jesus. It's probably not a new thing at this point. I think this is probably like, this is probably after John Lennon said that the Beatles are bigger than Jesus. Okay. And got into all that trouble. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if Mick Jagger is kind of seeking that whirlwind. Right. With that line and this song. Right. Like, I was around when Jesus Christ had his moment of doubt and pain. Like, how dare Mick Jagger identify with Jesus Christ? Right. As if, it's a weird thing to say, like, Jesus belongs to everyone except Mick. Like, this is designed for outrage. Like, yeah. it's not... Like Mick has said, I think you know later on, like he's he's, he's like sort of more thoughtful about it and, and and talks about what the song "Sympathy for the Devil" really means beyond the the reaction to it. Right. But he's clearly looking to get that reaction. Right. Like he's obviously kicking over the ant hill. Like you wouldn't say, "I was around when Jesus Christ had his moment of doubt and pain." Right. So you're not really supposed to think about Jesus's moment of doubt and pain. And I'm not a religious person. I'm not really into it, but I do understand a little bit of the argument. Well, I mean, is, is he referring specifically to like when he's on the cross and saying, "Why have you forsaken yeah. me?" Okay, yeah, I like that. That's that's what I think. I've heard some, like I read a couple of articles that are saying that like, no, it was when he was in the garden and having like. I don't think that's what it was at all. You know, I think does it even matter? Straight. No, he's just saying like I'm. I'm the reason yeah. I was there. Yeah. But this is the schism that's sort of been around since the very beginning of Christianity. That's the question. Where like if Jesus is on the cross, he says, "My God, why." Have you forsaken me? It yeah. goes right to the question of faith. Right. Because the, the Romans or the, the people of Jerusalem who are kind of gathered around and, and mocking Jesus are saying, like, if you're God, why isn't your God saving you? Exactly. And then all of a sudden Jesus is saying, my God, why have you forsaken right. me? So it's the He's real... having his moment of doubt. Like, I was wrong about all this. Exactly. Yeah. And you have to do the real Christian reading, the real faithful reading to understand why Christians respond to that line. Right. If you're not, if you're a surface person like me, then it really is just like, aren't you a bunch of hypocrites? <laughs> right. Which is, I think, what Mick is doing here. Right. Like, like he probably thought about it more deeply than that, but that's why he's going for that line for sure. Yeah. And then Mick goes on to say, uh, made damn sure that Pilate washed his hands and sealed his fate. So like, not only did the devil you know, put Jesus in that predicament, but then he made sure that the guy who was, uh, who, who he tricked into doing it, mm-hmm washed his hands and got away with the whole thing. Right. So he is clearly announcing in the first verse that this is, of course, the devil speaking in first person. Right. And I've heard like people saying like, oh, the song is about man as the devil. But when you read the lyrics, I'm like, no, he is literally yeah, he's writing up. as Satan. <laughs> yeah, like I am the devil. There's, yes. not, there's, there's ambiguity kind of built in, in in subtle phrases. Right. But overall... This is Mick's idea of what the devil would say exactly. were, were he to come back to, I think, to specific people. So then he goes into the chorus. He says, pleased to meet you. Hope you guess my name. But what's puzzling you is the nature of my game. Yeah. Is, is that saying, like, uh, 
I'm sure you know it's me. And is he saying like, why am I here? He might be saying, why am I here? But he's also like he's he's presenting himself as a very like he's a man of wealth and taste. Oh, like right. he's not what you're expecting the devil to be. He's not this beast. Right. He's not like the there's the great Hunter Thompson phrase where you know good Christians know that uh, that the devil uh, has the body of an alligator and the <laughs> and the face of a dinosaur and his mouth is filled with seven hundred teeth and he weighs a thousand pounds and he's the last thing that you want to feel getting a hold of your leg when you're trying to stay afloat in a lake of fire. <laughs> I'm picturing a Tim Burton like in Beetlejuice like the monsters they create. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's exactly like that. But he's not. He shows up and he's kind of like posh. An elegant man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, who could this possibly be? But I think that that, we'll get into it. Okay. Goes into the next verse. He says, I stuck around St. Petersburg when I saw it was time for a change. Killed the Tsar and his ministers. Anastasia screamed in vain. So this is the Russian Revolution. Yeah, this we're is... getting into a lot of history that Diane didn't pay attention to in history class. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to be going, uh-huh. <laughs> this is the fun stuff. This is when, <laughs> this is the Russian Revolution. This is where, like, as, as the Onion said, this is when bearded coffeehouse types seize power in Russia. <laughs> so he says, I killed the Tsar and his ministers. Anastasia screamed in vain. Anastasia is the daughter of Tsar Nicholas II. Okay. This is the, the, she would have been heir to the Romanov throne. Okay. And there was some thought, the Romanov family after the Russian Revolution were on the run and the Bolsheviks caught up to them and they were murdered. All of them were gunned down in a cellar. And, uh, and that was the end of the, of the Russian imperial family. However, uh, there was a woman named Anna Anderson who a couple of years later kind of appeared in Germany and she was claiming to be Anastasia. And her story was that she hadn't been killed. Like, like her whole family had been shot. And as her family was dead, she lay under the bodies and pretended to be dead. Ooh. And as the guards cleared away the bodies, a guard found that this little girl was still alive. And he protected her and swaddled her and smuggled her willow style out of Russia and into Germany in the early 1920s. And there, she started tried she tried to establish her identity as Anastasia, heir to the Romanov dynasty, and it became like a real historical mystery. Like, is this woman telling the truth or not? That's good stuff. And it went on for decades. Ooh. Like it was it was the conspiracy theory of the time. Right. Like it was all swirling around her. So she it, it gave her like access into certain levels of society. There were people that were sponsoring her. Uh, the Romanovs were like first cousins of the British royal family. And all of the royal families of Europe. So they sort of had an interest. Like they would send people who knew her or knew the family to go talk to her. And all of them, to a man, said, this is not Anastasia. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. But that didn't stop it because like entree into royal circles is a thing that's valuable to people. So there were, there were rich people who were kind of like taking care of her and sponsoring her and looking after her for decades as a court case was proceeding in Germany trying to prove that she was Anastasia. Around 1970, that court case got thrown out of the courts in Germany. So right around the time that, that Mick Jagger is writing this song, that court case is coming to a head. Wow. Yeah. Look at the timing on that. Well, I don't think it's, I don't think it's an accident at all. No. I think, I think it's just, I mean, Mick Jagger's a smart guy. Right. He's a really well-educated guy. Like London School of Economics. Like we think of him as like rock and roll bad boy Mick Jagger, but he's right. two things. Like he moves in, in two different worlds. He knows all this stuff. He, de he definitely put that in there. And I think he put it in there. As, like he says, I killed the Tsar and his ministers. Anastasia screamed in vain. So he's saying Anastasia screamed in vain. She screamed, doesn't matter, she's dead. Like, this woman is not Anastasia. Mm, I'm the devil, I killed them all. That's his side, is that she's dead. It wasn't her. Yeah, and I, but I also think that as a songwriter, he's using that to score credibility points. Right. Like he's saying, no, this is the devil. The devil knows all. Mm -hmm. I know you're over there wondering if this Anastasia woman is actually Anastasia Romanov. She's not. I killed her I in that cellar. Her. Yeah. All right. Then he says, I rode a tank, held a general's rank when the Blitzkrieg raged and the bodies stank. Ugh. So for an Englishman of, uh, of mixed age, mm -hmm. he's obviously talking about, about something that, that's within his memory. I think his dad was in World War II. Okay. Surely every man that he grew up with was a World War II veteran, right. right? There was no escaping. Yeah, so he's definitely saying, like, I fought in World War II. I caused World War II. I know how that goes. Right. And he's back to the chorus. I'm pleased to meet you. I hope you guess my name. But what's puzzling you is the nature of my game. game. And I, lo I love that wink and smile. I do too. Like he's letting you in on the story. He's telling it. But now he's like, he's like taunting the listener. Right. Like, now you get it. Now you know who you I get, am. You know mm -hmm. who you're talking to. Your hair standing up on the back of your neck yet? Mm-hmm. I watched with glee while your kings and queens fought for 10 decades for the gods they made. 
everything that I read said that that was like an allusion to the Crusades. Okay. That it's you know that it's, this is Christians and and Muslims fighting. Everybody just fighting over like these pretend gods or gods that um, it doesn't even matter. He he knows the truth. Yeah. He's been around since the beginning, and he just thinks this is um, fascinating. Yeah. And this is like him watching. Um, garbage television (laughs) well he's the devil like he's met god he's fought with god he's had a couple of eons of going around and around with god but then to say that your kings and queens have made these gods he's telling everybody in the world that these religions that you're worshiping are they're not correct yeah (laughs) and the hindu and your silly multiple armed gods and everything else yeah but i wonder if this is if this is also you know mick jagger englishman because he says it's 10 decades and 10 decades is a century so so I think probably private school Mick is talking more about the Hundred Years' War, which is France and England having their English Channel fight okay, got that it. they're kind of still having. I shouted out, who killed the Kennedys, when after all, it was you and me. This song came out in December of 69. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated in June of 69. Yeah. So like, while they're writing this song, like the, the original lyric was, I shouted out, who killed John Kennedy. Right. And then it's like, I shouted out, who killed the Kennedys. Because the second dude. Yeah. So he's just, he's just barreling straight ahead. Like you would think that a second Kennedy assassination, they're like, well, maybe we should rethink this song, guys. Do you think part of him was like, oh, I just made the song a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got two of them. <laughs> Couldn't have happened at a better time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think he probably did. Like he must, he must have done that. Like there's yeah. definitely, you know, an, an, an air of the naughty schoolboy in both Mick and Keith. Right. That I think we we do our best to forget about. Like, no, they're rock gods. <laughs> they're absolutely immortal. But then you look at like the old documentaries, like, no, I can still see them in the Blazers. Yeah. <laughs> they're definitely rude little boys. Like, rude little boys. Mm-hmm. Here's a chance for me to stick my thumb in your eye a bit. But also lyrically, like, he says, I shouted out he'll kill the Kennedys when after all it was you and me. So that's the first time, like, in, in everything else, it seems like he's taking credit for it. Right. You know, like he was there uh, when Jesus had his moment of doubt and pain. He was a general during the Blitzkrieg. Mm -hmm. He was hanging around St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. Like this is the first time he acknowledges like, no, we did this together. Yeah. Yeah, This is when he's like, I've infiltrated you in your brains too. Or I tricked you into doing it. Yeah. Like these men might've been very good for you, but I was there to double cross. Yes. So you can sort of feel the evil coming through. So let me please introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste, and I laid traps for troubadours who get killed before they reach Bombay. All right. That's the mysterious one. Yeah. So do you have that? Because I have that in my notes, what that's all about. And that's just going to be a bunch of me rambling, reading. Do you have a summary of what that's about? Yeah. it's the Apparently, it's the, the, the thuggy cult in India. Yeah. And I'm going to ramble and babble as well, because I think... I think what Mick is alluding to and what he really means are, are different things in this line. Okay. Like, I think he's, he's alluding to uh, the thuggy cult in India. What they would do is they were, they were like highwaymen. They were like thieves. Right. Kind of like the Scarlet Pimpernel. You know, yep. they, 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 they would, uh, there were thousands of them. And if as artists or traders or, or anybody was moving through India, they'd be waylaid by the thuggy cult. Right. Robbed, murdered, usually with a garret, like, you know, strangled. And that's how you would go, and they would steal all of your stuff. Well, the English, who were subjugating India for a couple of centuries in the 1830s, they went in and stamped out the thuggy cult, or what they called the thuggy cult. Mm-hmm. Uh, but part of that is the English trying to to trample the Indian nation. Like, I don't know too much about it. I've only done okay. like, a little bit of reading, but it sounds to me more just like, like, like the English are just like, okay, there's these guys, the thuggies. Like, you identify an enemy, and then it allows you to stamp them out. But in reality, what's probably happening is there was a bunch of, or everybody in India who didn't want British rule was doing everything they could to stop English caravans, English traders, English artists, any Englishman they could uh-huh. out in the wilderness. Like, okay, great. This is like, we can kill you. Yeah. But when you're trying to sell it back to the English people, you have to come up with this fanciful tale. Right. It can't be, we're the evil empire out there stomping out freedom fighters. It has to be the other side of that. So he helped lay traps yeah. for the English. Yes. Yes. For troubadours. And what is Mick Jagger if not a troubadour? Yes. So I think he's kind of like he's acknowledging himself in this character. Like he's like this seems to be like the one line where he's stepping out of the Beals above character and saying, I lay traps for troubadours who get killed before they reach Bombay. Like, Mick, you're a troubadour. Yes. You're gonna get killed as well. And uh who else 
Where, where else were the thuggy cults referenced in Om Nam Shabai, Om Nam Shabai, Om Nam Shabai. <laughs> the thuggy cult is in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. <laughs> Which what we a- have been showing my son lately. My son has been <laughs> begging to watch Indiana Jones and he wants to see Temple of Doom. And we were like, okay, but there's just one part that's too violent. And we don't want you to see it. And it's where they rip the guy's heart out and it's beating in his hand. And he's like, argues with us. He's like, I can handle it. And I was like, it's not that I, that you can't handle it. I don't want my six-year-old having those visions. I don't want to turn you dark yet. <laughs> <laughs> Your son's like in a house full of David Bowie and Cure posters. Like, oh. I don't want to turn you dark. I'm oh, sorry, son. I just try to play erasure music for him. I'm going to turn him gay before I turn him dark. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. <laughs> <clears throat> you can't get turned gay. You become gay from watching Magic Mike in the middle of a lightning storm. Forget, forget what movie I stole that from. <laughs> <It's a great laughs> I think it was an episode of Thirty Rock. <laughs> that makes sense. It sounds like a Tina Fey line. <laughs> All right, pleased to meet you. Hope you guess my name, but what's puzzling you is the nature of my game. The first five minutes of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom is the very peak of American cinema. What's the first five minutes? It's the opening montage where the uh, where Kate Capshaw is singing uh, uh, "Anything Goes." Okay. So it's the big like like kick line. She's performing in in Hong Kong. She's yes. an American showgirl. Yes. And then it goes into. Uh, she's meeting Lao Che, the rich Chinese man who owns this club and is putting it on. And then Indiana Jones makes his big entrance and he's wearing James Bond's white suit and bow tie. Mm-hmm. And he comes in and sits down and they're going to deal. He's got a diamond that Lao Che wants, uh, but then Lao Che poisons him. You know, the, the, you know, do you remember the, like the, the, the spinning table, like the lazy Susan table? That's right. It's been mm-hmm. a long time since, because this was my favorite one. I saw it before I saw the first one, but I hadn't seen it in years. And, uh, I wasn't paying attention when Corbin put it on for Charlie. I was, I think I walked in when they were already like, like in the, is it a cave? Is it whatever it yep. is? The temple? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're like literally in the temple of doom. Yeah. Gotta see the opening. The opening five minutes are absolutely incredible. I just remember the little Asian boy and Dr. Jones. And then yeah. uh, I knew that the woman was dating the director. Yes. That's, yeah. Spiel- yeah, that's where Spielberg met Kate Capshaw. Yeah. Cause he always jokes just like, yeah, hey, Indiana Jones, you know, got the, got the stone, but I got the girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a great one because it's it's a uh, they're looking for the antidote and the diamond, mm-hmm. and uh, and Kate Capshaw's running around looking for the diamond. Indiana Jones is trying to get the antidote. He finally gets it. They escape, and they're getting onto the plane. And Lao Che's men have chased him, and uh, Indiana Jones goes, "Nice try, Lao Che," as he slams the door. And then it says, "Lao Che Airlines." Nice. Oh, yeah. It's like it's classic Spielberg opening. That's great. It's like five minutes. That that's movie should always open that way. <laughs> Sorry for the digression. Okay. But anyway. Just as every cop is a criminal and all the sinner saints, as heads is tails, just call me Lucifer because I'm in need of some restraint. So mm-hmm. if you meet me, have some courtesy, have some sympathy and some taste. Use all your well-learned politics or I'll lay your soul to waste. I always thought this was pretty badass. It really is. It, it's pretty badass to be like, I don't care if you don't like me. I don't care. But you will respect me. Yeah. You will not. I will not be ignored. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly like that. <laughs> like everything that I've like, like everything that I read about this song was always talking about how, he, oh, this is the, how the devil will present himself. He'll present himself as an as an elegant man, as a rich man, as an educated mm-hmm. man. You know, like that's the trick that the devil. He's been does. next to you this whole time. Yeah. Yeah. He makes you believe that he's that he's someone that he's not. Right. As I was reading this song this time through, like I was thinking, like, like the devil's got to present himself to different groups of people all the time. Like I think that that Mick's intention here wasn't to present the devil as an elegant man; it was to present the devil as a man presenting himself to elegant people. Oh, like if Mick Jagger is the is the spokesman for the great hippie unwashed, right? You know the the tattered long hairs. Then who is the like? And if all of those long haired people are evil. Right. The then, elegant people are looking at them as evil, yeah. but they don't realize they're rubbing shoulders with them. Yeah. If, yeah. if Mick's going to have to go speak for them, then he's going to have to go speak to elegant people. He's yeah. going to have to go talk to the Queen of England. He's going to have to go talk to whoever was Prime Minister of England at this time. Right. Uh, he's going to have to go have a, have a talk with noted elegant man Richard Nixon. Right. So he's going to have to like ingratiate himself into those things. And I think that's why you know he says, I'm pleased to meet you, or pleased to meet you, if you guess my name. And of course, a line like, use all your well-learned politess. Mm-hmm. Like if you're in the crowd at Altamont 
getting beaten up by the Hell's Angels yeah. in your tatty hippie clothes, you don't have a lot of well-learned politess. No, you don't. Like, Mick's not addressing his fans here. No. He's addressing his fans' enemies. Yeah, I like it. Ooh, says I. I like it. Should we talk about the Ultima thing and Carla Santana, or wait till we get done with these lyrics? We're more or less done with the lyrics because it's just a, just a chorus. Yeah, yeah, he gets over and over. Mm. Tell me, baby, what's my name? Can you guess my name? Uh, yeah. Mm. All right. Yeah, we're pretty much done with those lyrics. Tell me, baby, what's my name? So I did not realize Carlos Santana was such a clutching his pearls Christian. And, <laughs> and he is scared of the devil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read a little bit of this. Carlos Santana thought the Stones were playing with fire with this song, um, which is a fun like, callback to another mm -hmm. song. Um, he says, I don't have no sympathy for the devil. He said in an N E N is that New York? No, I don't know. N M E interview. I like the beat of the song, but I never identify with the lyric. Jagger and Richards don't really know the full extent of what they're talking about. If they knew what they were getting into when they sang that song, they would not be doing it. The devil is not Santa Claus. He's for real. Come on, Carlos. They know that they're not singing about Santa Claus. They know, okay? Uh, he He's, I think, overly... Um, What's the word? It's it's a very Catholic thing, just into the rituals, into the. Um... No, I don't know. He's yeah, he's he's clearly under the influence of his abu here. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, Carlos, you stay away. So a little bit more here. Santana was one of the performers at the ill-fated Altamont concert when Carlos claimed he could feel a demonic presence during the Stones' set. A striking contrast to Woodstock, where the group conjured up peace and love. Santana didn't allow any of their footage into the Gimme Shelter film. Um, you got to take Carlos Santana's yeah. word for it because he was at Woodstock and Altamont. That's true. So he said that Altamont is, uh, was demonic. I, all right, I'm listening. Right. As it probably was. That was, like, did we talk about it on another episode? What? I think we talked. We talked about Altamont. We did, yeah. Who was, oh no, it was, uh, it was, uh, Jefferson Airplane. Yes. It was, yeah, they were organizing it. Altamont that's in right. Mick Jagger's apartment. They just threw that together. Like, obviously, like, Altamont was famously meant to be the West Coast answer to the East Coast's Woodstock. Okay, and yeah. The Rolling Stones were just going to just roll in there and just play a free show with Santana and, and Jefferson Airplane and whoever they could get to play with them. But they did the counterculture thing, and they hired the Hells Angels to be their security guards, yep. which... I don't, why doesn't why don't why don't we listen to Hunter Thompson? He could have told him. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think Hunter Thompson wrote Hell's Angels in 1967, two years before, and he just absolutely center shot the bullseye. Like the Hell's Angels at the time were looked on as this this real youthful menace. Right. You know, like they were they were rising up, like they were the rising tide. They were in league with the hippies. It was thought of like that, that the Hell's Angels were going to be like they were like the violent wing of the of the peace and love movement. Right. But anybody who'd hung out with them knew that nothing could be further from the truth. Right. You know? They're dangerous and evil. They're dangerous. They're they're decidedly right wing. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're only into each other, right? They, like that's the only thing they're concerned about. They're right. Not, they're not concerned about they're not concerned about the hippie movement. They're not really concerned about the war movement. All they want to do is is ride their motorcycles and and be at the top of the totem pole. Exactly. Right? They want to be the baddest asses that they could possibly be, and then sort of put them in a situation where they're providing security for the Rolling Stones against their own fans is obviously a recipe for disaster from the very beginning. Right. There's no way that that could have worked out any other way. Uh, there's, of course, this famous footage you know, from the Altamont concert of the Rolling Stones like stopping you know, in the middle of Under My Thumb. Mm -hmm. I think in the middle of Sympathy for the Devil as well, where Mick Jagger's doing that. All right, everybody sit down. Yeah. Hell's Angels, everybody. Yeah. Like it's obviously getting out of control, and it's a clear nightmare footage to watch. Because someone got stabbed. Mm -hmm. And they got uh, the actual stabbing happened during Under My Thumb, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. So, do um, you think Carlos Santana is like, see? See? Yes, absolutely. I told you. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure he regrets performing in that. I'm sure. I'm sure he probably regrets like not saying anything about it. I imagine that everybody, everybody other than the Rolling Stones, who are looking at the at the way they put that concert together, must have been looking at this can't be. Yeah, this I know. Was, this was wrong from the get go. Right. I don't. Know. I don't like talking about Altamont in the end of the '60s. No. Mm. Uh, yeah. Can you imagine being at a concert when shit like this happens? No. Think about that Vegas concert where people are getting shot. No. Uh, our friends at Dumb Love Podcast have a, a story about a couple 
who met during that concert no in way. Vegas. And like they met for the first time. Mm. And um they're kinda you know, she's kinda making fun of him. Like one the guy came down from like Canada and she was from somewhere else and they met at this concert mm. and uh then the shooting started happening and they realized it wasn't fireworks and uh he immediately is like takes the protective move over her and mm-hmm. helps get her out of there and into a cab. Mm-hmm. And um, as they're getting into a cab, a woman had been shot in, in the stomach and was bleeding and they got her into the cab and got her into the hospital. And then they spent the night in the hospital. And then after that, um, they back went back to their homes, but kind of started talking to each other online because they were the only two people they could bond with over this tragedy yeah. that had happened. And uh, long story short, they ended up getting married, but it's great. That's actually, that's, Turns into a sweet story, but yeah. what a horror show. Can you imagine no. being at a place where like people are like getting killed? <laughs> I've tried to put my mind like like into that space. Like every time I read about that the story of the Vegas shooting. Mm-hmm. And you think about how <sighs> So he opens fire, right? And from everything that I've read, like like he he's, he opens fire on this massive crowd in from his hotel mm-hmm. building, like twelve floors up or however many floors up he was. And he's just pot shotting at people with all of the ammunition and all of the rifles that you could possibly imagine. So he's right. got all the time in the world to get this done. From the the, the first shot to the last shot, I think it was something like 11 minutes, <sighs> which is when you think it's of it... It's an eternity. It's an eternity. But when you think of it like in police response time, like you're not expecting something like that. Right. Like, But to think that you go from the first shot being fired to he's in that window, he's in that hotel, he's on that floor get everybody geared up, get up there and put a stop to it to get that job done in 11 minutes. No, impossible. But a total hero show. Like yeah. absolutely. Like, how did you guys do that? Like that's, that's a, that's a miracle of teamwork. It's a miracle of organization. But right. if you're under a concrete embankment or you're lying on top of your new girlfriend that you've met, hoping that you don't get hit 11 minutes under fire is a crazy, crazy length of time. I've yeah. never been shot at. Not even once. No. Like, I've been close to um, shootings. Uh, we were at that joysticks. Do you remember that video oh, yeah. game place? And uh, a drive-by shooting happened across the street at a, um, a that was like, it used to be Hyperia or something, yeah. like an after hours club. So we're outside of joysticks and we hear like, and it, you always think it's fireworks. It yep. always sounds like fireworks. And we were like, where are the fireworks? And then you saw people running towards us away from that club and everybody, I think I was with Rob Mungle, everybody do inside and we're like it's a drive-by like there's a shooting and there is a like an immediate sense of like you can't duck from a bullet like you don't know where they're coming from and you don't know if it's gonna start coming at you and it's a uh, it's terrifying yeah there's absolutely nowhere to go no i couldn't no i, I couldn't wouldn't want to and lucifer was there <laughs> for all of that. lucifer is always there so mm-hmm. is that is that all we have to say about sympathy about for sympathy the devil? devil? No. No, nope, we got more. I think we can. Sympathy for the devil, I think, is is unique. Like I'm I'm far from being like a rock historian, but this seems like the first like real hit song where the where the where this the speaker is taking on a character. Mm-hmm. Right. Where I mean Mick Jagger's not speaking for Mick. He's obviously he's speaking for the devil. Right. And that kind of laid the groundwork for other songs that would that would come later on. Uh, do you know the U two song Until the End of the World? Is there a U2 song I don't know? There, no, what no, album is that on? It's on Acton, baby. Maybe. It's, uh, I haven't seen you in quite a while. I was sit down the hole just passing time. Mm. <laughs> okay, okay. So who is he speaking as? That that song is obviously, I think, a takeoff of, of Sympathy for the Devil because okay. that song is meant to be what Judas would say to Jesus mm. were they to ever meet again. Interesting. So I think like like that's where you know, the, the songwriting craft kind of takes off. You know, Mick Jagger sort of plants the seed, and then a guy like Bono can take it to can take it a step further. I, was, I just thought of the song "The Devil Went Down to Georgia." There's <laughs> 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 the devil, like you know, asks this guy to you know places a bet with him for the fiddle playing. But yeah, that's the only one other one that came to mind. <laughs> well, the Stones were recording "Sympathy for the Devil." Have you heard this story? I think I know where you're going. Well, they were recording Sympathy for the Devil. A lamp caught fire yes. and it burned up the studio. It burned most of their equipment, uh-huh. but it didn't burn the tapes uh-huh. that Sympathy for the Devil was on. He's like slipping in saying like, yeah, I am here. That's the devil power. And I'm going to show you my power, but I'm going to let you put this song out so everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> 
Ooh, I love spooky stories like that. You hear about all these horror films where like shit went down during recording and it makes it extra spooky. Like some bad shit happened during the exorcist. Like people died mm-hmm. during make- the making of that. And then of course the little girl from Pol- Poltergeist died mm-hmm. during the last one that they did with her. And the very last scene, I think it's, is it the third one? Where they're holding the little girl that looks like her, but it isn't her because she died already. So the final scene doesn't even have the real her in it. Mm-hmm. Um but I'm also like, okay, let's go through even happy movies. I'm sure every movie has had shit go down and people die during it, you know, but we zone in on the the creepy ones. It's really good. Right. We also like give it credit. Like, like we, like even you and I who are a little like, like cynical and, and being funny about this, like we give Mick and Keith credit for like, oh, well, if anybody has a portal, you know, a direct line <laughs> to Satan, it's got to be one of the two of them, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Satan's going to find the people who can get his message out the strongest. He's mm-hmm. going to go with um, celebrities. <laughs> right. But we don't, I don't, I, I usually don't think about it from the, from the other end where like, like somebody like, like Mick and Keith are going to want to like, they're going to want to activate the occult. You know, they're going to want to access that power and and take it for themselves. Yeah. Kind of like in the way that the, the Hells Angels would, would wear swastikas. Right. Like they're not explicitly racist. They're not doing it because they're of, of any like anti-Semitism or any affinity for Nazi Germany. Right. They're doing it because if you put a swastika on, it scares people. Yes. Like it backs people down right away, right now. That's a good point. Like I think that's what... I think that's why he's writing a song called Sympathy for the Devil. Like yeah. He's setting himself up to be a rock god. He's like, can I be a rock evil god? Yeah. Is there, is there any way I could make you scared of me for the rest of your life? And it's so crazy, especially back then. And like, you know, most of America is pretty conservative still, um, especially then that um, they still just weren't shunned. And they it just fired them higher, you know? Yeah. Well, I think because like, like as, as much as I kind of like, like make fun of it and, and, and sniff it at, at, at what they're trying to do, what they're trying to do is ultimately a very good thing because like, I don't doubt for a second that when, that like after Mick Jagger started getting rolling on this, on these ideas and, 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 you know, getting the lyrics out that he absolutely was trying to get down to the thesis of the song, which is, you know, the off quoted, like mock the devil and he will flee from me. Exactly. Like, I think Keith has a, has a great quote about it, right? Yeah. I have it here. Keith Richards in 2002 said, sympathy is quite an uplifting song. It's a matter of looking at the devil in the face. He's there all the time. I've had a very close contact with Lucifer. I've met him several times. Evil people tend to bury it and hope it sorts itself out and doesn't rear its ugly head. Sympathy for the devil is just as appropriate now with nine 11. And, you know, he talks about, 9-11 and all these wars. And, but the big line is he says, don't forget him. If you confront him, then he's out of a job. Yeah, I don't, I don't doubt that for a second. Like, yeah. I, I don't think for a second. I think that because the line about the Kennedys was going to have to be so, was going to be so controversial, mm-hmm. they must have known that they had an idea in that song that could, that could counteract that controversy. Like, they could, they could, they could, like they had the hose that could put out those flames. Right. Like they started that fire, but they could also come back in and just go, look, the devil's inside every single one of us. Yes. Those men would still be alive if not for the evil that we, uh, that we bred. Right. Do you want to talk about Mikhail Bulgakov? <laughs> Mikhail Bulgakov. <laughs> Bulgakov. <laughs> Mikhail Bulgakov. And what is it? It's the, uh, the Master and the Margarita. Yeah, the lyrics were inspired by The Master and the Margarita, a book by Mikhail Bulgakov. <laughs> I just like saying yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Bulgakov. 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 I'm putting the, I'm not putting it on the right. Okay, in the middle. Bulgakov. You need to listen to more hockey highlights. <laughs> Bulgakov to Nemchinov to Samsonov. He scores. It just, it, 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 Say it what? flows trippingly off your tongue. Eventually, <laughs> <laughs> British singer Marianne Faithhill was Mick Jagger's girlfriend at the time, and she gave him the book. Faithhill came from an upper upper class background and exposed Jagger to a lot of new ideas. In the book, the devil is a sophisticated socialite, a man of wealth and taste. Yes. So that's where that came from. But he also like the I I, from, I haven't read the book, but from a couple of articles I read about it, they also imagined like a an, an artist in Russia who is Jesus mm. and he gets arrested and committed to a mental institution because he believes that he is the Messiah. Got it. But I think got in the it. book he actually is Jesus. Oh, got so, it. Which is what's going to happen to you or what's going to happen to Jesus. Should he ever come back and declare that he is, he is definitely. Oh, he's going, going down. He's going to a mental People institution. People ain't having it. Nobody's listening to that. The actual message. No, thank you. No, thank you. Woo-hoo. Woo-hoo. I like 
Uh, Apparently, that was Anita Pallenberg. Yes. Like they, they I guess, uh, Sympathy for the Devil started dating off. Dating Richard. She was dating. She's dating Keith at the time, but I, I guess Brian Jones. She was Brian Jones's girlfriend, and then Keith swooped in and okay. stole her. Got it. As if that's a thing that can happen. But apparently, <laughs> apparently, it did. Anita Pallenberg had no mind of her own. Was abducted by Keith Richards. Mm-hmm. She, I guess, they came into the, the recording studio and they were recording Sympathy for the Devil as if it were. Like a folk song, like a Dylan-esque kind of thing. That's right. It was supposed to start off as a folk song. Yeah, and it sort of feels that way. Like when it, 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 I've always loved this song, but it wasn't until I started like, like, like kind of digging into the lyrics a little bit. It was like, pleased to meet you, hope you guess my name, but was puzzling you is the nature of my game. That reminds me so much of, of Dylan's, yeah. uh, there's something going on here, but you don't know what it is, exactly. do you, Mr. Jones? Like, yeah. I think that's, that's mixed adoption of, of Bob Dylan's taunt. But I guess it wasn't until until Anita Pallenberg came into the studio that they started mixing in the uh, the samba rhythms. Yes. Like, like she came in and started doing the hoo hoo, which I didn't realize that either. I thought it was like hoo hoo. I thought it was just a vocal inflection, but it's who. It's a question. Who? Yeah. Who 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 is singing this song? Who could it possibly be? Yeah, it's I weird to go back into either. this song, like because I've never not known that "Sympathy for the Devil" is from the point of view of the devil. Like there must have been like somebody like like Christmas nineteen sixty nine. It's like I got it, man. <laughs> no, here it is. <laughs> Go back and listen to it. Write it down. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Mix the devil. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. It's really I like how people can start a song with one like this is what the song is going to be, and then it just let it evolve into something way bigger and yep. way more fun mm-hmm. and way creepier. And it probably did because it was such a weird, you know, like spaced out time. Mm-hmm. Mix the devil. Paul's dead. There's a man on the moon. There's a criminal in the White House. <laughs> Things are fucking crazy, dude. Do you think you would have liked to live in that time better than the times we're living in now? No. Do you think they're equally insane? No, I don't think they're equally insane. No? I really don't. And I, I, like, I've been like, like seeking comfort in... in like the older men that I know, like tell me about the sixties. Like, yeah. I know, like I never would have done this you yeah. know, prior to this day and age. And it's, it's oddly reassuring because the way they look at it is just like, Hey, like this too shall pass. There's no draft. There's no war. Oh, that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think about, um, <laughs> I think about that movie, great balls of fire. And when Nona Ryder's mm-hmm. character is like, she's just stressed out. Cause the bomb <laughs> yeah. is the bomb going to come at any day. I don't, I don't know. There's every, is there a decade where they just weren't living in some crazy fear at some point? Like, were the 70s I think okay? <laughs> I, think, I think what we're living in now is kind of the, the shadow that, that this cast. Like, it wouldn't surprise me at all if, if like, like, Mick Jagger kind of, like, like, like I've got a lot, of, a lot of sympathy, a lot of empathy for, for devout Christians and devout people who are devoutly religious. Right. Because it takes a lot of energy to live your life that way. It yeah. takes a lot of devotion. You have, to, you have to really commit to it. And to have somebody like Mick Jagger come along and wink at it and smile at it and spit on it and and make fun of it has got to be it has to be hugely insulting. But is he spitting on it because Christians a thousand percent believe in mm. hell and the devil and it's almost like they're like yeah listen to this guy. Yeah, well, they don't a thousand percent believe that Mick Jagger is the devil. No, not Mick they, Jagger, mm. but um, they certainly don't want him like adopting that power yeah. or seizing that power or like Carlos Santana says, you know, playing around with things that he doesn't really understand. Right. You know, they want you like, stay out of my sandbox. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like I'd really rather you not be in there. Yeah. But when I think of things like, you know, what's puzzling Don't wink you. at it. Yeah. I yeah. know what you're saying. Okay. Like I see a lot of what's going on in America today in that, uh, what's puzzling you is the nature of my game or there's something going on here. You don't know what it is. Do you, Mr. Jones? Mm-hmm. It's just a reversal, you know, like, like, the hippies, the counterculture now, or Mr. Jones. Like, we're the ones kind of like, I, I don't understand the nature of this game. Yeah. Like, I just don't get it anymore. It's like, the, the, I, I think that a big part of, of, of where the, the world is headed in this lurch to the right is it's a real turning of the tables. Yeah. Like, Interesting. The song has layers. My goodness. Mm, sorry, was that depressing? Mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't I mean, mean to bum you out, man. It's going to be all right. I'm okay being bummed out. I like being <laughs> bummed out. I can wallow. I can get dark and wallow. You can wallow with the best of them. Yeah. That's my whole teenagers. Well, that's sympathy for the devil. And I guess that's what they're going, they're getting at. Like, that's what the, that's the, kind of goes to the crux of the hippie culture a little bit, doesn't it? It's like, like, all you need is love and you better have that with you. Because if you don't have love, then you better have your sympathy for the devil. Oof. What a nice just juxtaposition during that time. 
dynamite drop in. I was really proud of that one. I was in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Join us next week when I take the pretentiousness to the next level. Oh, we hope so. We want you to. <laughs> Um, we need to do some dress up like a douche. We do. Pleasure song. So I'll do dress up like a douche. This is from Kim on Twitter. Uh, she goes by awkward. I always love her Twitter handle. It's awkward. Osaurus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's the Beatles. Uh, it's another Beatles one. We had one last week too. Um, another Beatles one. She had a friend and I don't mind if you don't have a misheard song lyric of your own tattle on a friend. We're okay with that. She had a friend in college who thought the Beatles song Paperback Writer was saying, take a back right turn. <laughs> it's a, it's a take a back right turn. <laughs> she says in her defense, the Beatles could write about anything and make it sound awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and I have written in my notes Beatles versus Stones, which we've already covered. Because I was always like, you know, not growing up in that era, I was like, why do all these people... People always pit them against each other. Why do you have to be one or the other? And I didn't realize at the time they were the two biggest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, Ben, mm -hmm. do you have a guilty pleasure song? Guilty pleasures. I do. I have a, I have a guilty song and, and this is a, it's a shame song. Okay. It's uh my guilty pleasure song is justify my love by Madonna. And yeah, Wanting. exactly. Wait. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. For you. It's like I'm 11 years old again. To justify my life. What? No, I'm just listening to the Madonna song. It's nothing, nothing. I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything. I'm just, Such just oh. got the headphones in, listening to a song that I, that I really like. Mom, get out of my room. Exactly. <laughs> Such a horny song. <laughs> <laughs> that whole, what was the movie she made? What's the name of it? Um... All on blonde. Oh, truth or dare. Truth or dare. Yeah. It's just Madonna was horny. <laughs> <laughs> she was harnessing her sexuality, girlfriend. She was owning herself. Oh, no, I'm being a bad and feminist. If she happened to be owning me along the way, so much the better. <laughs> so much humping. <laughs> so much like masturbating on a bed in concert where you're like, dang girl. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it, Ben, but that was a, that was kind of a jam. It had a nice beat behind it. It was like, there was another, I think there was some controversy about that beat. Like it was too close, stolen from another song. Anyway, yeah. I won't get into that. I used to work at a, at a real quiet bar in kind of a strange part of town. And uh, it was often just me and maybe one or two other guys just sitting in there drinking. I'm, I'm bartending. And uh, Madonna's Immaculate Collection was mm -hmm. on the jukebox. Uh -huh. And Justify My Love is on that. So every now and again, Justify My Love would kind of spiral through. And there was one afternoon, it was just me and some dusty old guy who was just getting drunk and being sad. Uh. And Justify My Love comes on and we're just staring at each other. And the most awkward, I, I just, and I, I, like, I could skip it, but I didn't want to. <laughs> You're like, let's <laughs> like, see how this plays out. Mm -hmm. um, Who's going to blink first? You play yeah, I was going to say, did you play Stare Eyes? <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to blink first? I'm not going to, I'm comfortable with it. I don't have a boner. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like another whiskey, sir? What are you thinking about? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. All right. My guilty pleasure song. Um, and it's funny because I think, it, you know, it was just a popular with like, you know, the headbangers and the meatheads during the time. But now we we make fun of it every year on Mother's Day. But mine is Mother by Danzig. Mo I don't think I know that one. Ooh, <laughs> it's Mother. Tell your children not to walk my way. Tell your children not to hear my words. It's it's a great song. It, it goes like, he's like, Rah! he starts screaming. <laughs> um, but it becomes a joke every Mother's Day <laughs> because <laughs> everybody starts, mother. And I made a joke on Twitter this year. It's um, like phone rings and uh, a woman's like, hello. And it's dancing going, mother. And she just goes, hi, sweet pea. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Which we I always to, think is so funny. We need to pick a Danzig song at some point because I need to dig in on that guy. I love Danzig. I Do love I loved the Misfits and I love Danzig. I really don't know anything about him. Like I know a handful of Misfits songs. I've heard some Danzig stories, and for whatever reason, like in my mind, he's like the this is everything I don't like about rock and roll. Oh really? Yeah. Um he's uh his lyrics are good. I think you'd like the lyrics mm -hmm. if you kind of dive in. And uh he sounds like Elvis. He, his voice can sound exact. His he's got some ballads and some slow songs that are very good. Um, it's just fun to me. Danzig and the Misfits were fun, and I just remember going to see Danzig in the '90s, and I was I would do the mosh. It was one of the, like the the worst times I got hurt in a mosh pit. Mm -hmm. um, I was riding the crowd, and you kind of I would always try to ride the crowd when the songs like were slower or took a lull. 
and I did that. And then right when like a, it got heavy and mm-hmm. then everybody forgot about me and just dropped me and started like moshing. And I fell to the ground. My like legs were like, I was like, um, what do you call it? Jackknife kind yeah. of, but on the ground and then just getting stepped on and trampled. Oh, it was like, oh, what am I doing in here? But then I also, I rode the crowd again. And the way you would ride the crowd is everybody kind of like, like, take you point you towards the front of the stage where there's like um, a space between the crowd and the band and where security guards would catch you and you could walk away. And uh, they did this weird thing where they threw me in this weird way. Like my feet were near the security guard, but they heaved my body, my upper body forward. And Danzig was close to the stage and his big combat boot was there. And I just like, gah, like grabbed his boot. <laughs> I like latched onto it. Like I got him. <laughs> and then they, the security guard pulled me off and I had to go. But um, anyway, that's my Danzig concert story. <laughs> Throw a shoe at Glenn Danzig one of these days. <laughs> Guilty pleasures. All right, guys, that was Sympathy for the Devil. A uh, little bit of business as usual. If you would like to join the Patreon. Oh, today was a Patreon vote. Uh, they had under my thumb Sympathy for the Devil and Paint It Black, I think. And this uh, this one, uh, there were no votes for any other songs. So if you would like to be a part of that, go to patreon.com slash rock the cash bar. We have one tier and it's $5 a month. And you'll get some cool rock the cash bar swag and a chance to vote on Thursday songs. I posted the link. Uh, to our Spotify playlist on our website. And that Spotify playlist has every song that we cover as well as guilty pleasure songs. So uh, find that link at rockthecashbarpodcast.com. Thank you for tuning in. New episodes every Monday and Thursday. If you have a misheard song lyric you'd like us to read on the podcast, email us at rockthecashbarpodcast at gmail.com. Tweet us, Facebook us, find us on all the things. Thank you guys so much. And I will see you on Monday. (laughs) Vogue.